Combined arms warfare is a word that is often used by me as well, and the general consensus is that it is difficult, but the question is why is this the case? For this we talk with Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Tom Simmons from the Royal Military Academy in Brussels, who wrote an article about combined arms warfare in the Defense Horizon Journal. Be aware that the views expressed in these interviews don't represent the views of the Belgian Armed Forces. So let us start off with a basic definition of combined arms warfare. The American definition, uh, which is generally uh, taken over by, by a lot of countries, it's uh, combined arms warfare is about uh, the synchronized and simultaneous applications uh, of arms. So infantry, uh, engineering, artillery, uh, tanks, uh, reconnaissance forces in order to uh, achieve an effect greater than if each of these arms was used either separately or sequentially. It's about working together uh, on the battlefield, but closely working uh, together. Um, to my students, I often explain it as an orchestra. You can have a good violin player and a good trumpet player, but if you don't manage to get them to play together well, the orchestra will be terrible. And, and that's what this combined arms war ha warfare has to do. You can have excellent uh, tank platoons, like excellent infantry platoons, but if they don't perform well together on the battlefield, they will not have a maximum rendement, uh, a maximum efficiency. So, so that is what it is all about. And, and uh, achieve, uh, achieve an effect greater than if they were used separately. You can call, also call it bad mathematics. Uh, let's say that if you say tanks plus infantry plus artillery should make three. But if you do combined arms warfare, they will make five. So there every arm becomes, let's say, a force multiplier for the other one. That's the, that's the whole idea of, of combined arms warfare. Um, and, and there are many reasons why it's very hard and, and basically um, it's very hard because, uh, well, if you're into the military, you, you need to be trained, first of all, as an individual, you need to put on, know how to put on your, your uniform, your, your boots, uh, how to handle your weapon, make a backpack, put up a tent, it's thing, things like that. And after that, you, you become a specialist, either it's a tank driver or a gunner or whatever, but that is also another training you have to do. And then you need to be training with your friends, let's say with four on a tank or with six uh, for a howitzer or a gun. Um, and that is also another training that needs to be done. And then one tank needs to learn to work with other tanks in a platoon and in a company. That's, that's again, a higher level of training. And then only at the end, when your company or your battery is, is trained enough, you can start thinking about working with infantry or working with engineers. And since it's the final step, I think, in, in training exercises, it's a step that many units never reach because there's a spillover of soldiers and NCOs and officers leaving and new tank drivers coming in, which had to start from scratch. So it's, it's very difficult to advance in your training sessions. And there are other reasons why uh, combined arms warfare is difficult to train. You need to, the, these training uh, planes, uh, the training fields where you can perform a combined arms warfare, warfare training. Um, you need to have a, uh, uh, the, the money to do so because it's, it's very expensive. Uh, so, so there are numerous reasons why it's very hard to, to do it. Um, and, and, and one thing that is often forgotten, I think, as a historian, is that uh, armies generally are very conservative. And uh, people tend to protect their branch or their arm. And infantry thinks we are the best and the rest should support us. And the tanks think likewise and artillery thinks the same. So it, it really requires an open spirit, an open mind from all officers uh, to, to understand the importance of combined arms warfare. Whereas I, I think many armies have a tendency to protect their own, their own arm, their, their infantry, their tanks, and, and we don't need to rest. And, 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 but I certainly believe that the, the 20th century has proven that combined arms warfare is uh, not a guarantee, but an important factor uh, for success on, on the battlefield. So, so you mentioned that it's synchronous and simultaneous. So basically the, the opposite or the stage before is sequential. So 
if I get this correctly, um, let's say basically combined arms warfare evolved in the first world war from my understanding, mostly the modern combined arms warfare. And so if you look at a 1914, a sequential approach would be the Germans attack and French position and at first they fire the artillery, I don't know, for one hour. And then after they stop and after five minutes, the infantry comes out or, or after 15 minutes, depending on the yes. how well they are already synchronized or yeah. not. And yeah. at that point, the, the French, of course, took losses from artillery, but the infantry is not suppressed anymore and they are ready for the oncoming attack. Whereas exactly. in, in, a, in a synchronized way, basically, the, the artillery fires to the very edge of the Germans, of the infantry, jumping into the trenches. And I remember specifically in interwar period, a, a German wrote in a book, like, the own infantry has to take losses from the own artillery when storming the enemy positions, else it's not a proper infantry. It was like, if, if the infantry can't take losses from friendly fire, from friendly artillery, it's not a proper infantry. I was like, okay, that's an interesting take on friendly fire. I mean, of course, this is another way of friendly fire because there's also friendly fire where you think it's an enemy. So, so this is basically the, the main, the main um, disting, uh, distinction. So that yeah. the synchronized versus sequential. Uh, yes, that's that's one thing. So um, you, you you can ask yourself the question whether the Russian tactics that we see a lot of in Ukraine now, where artillery fires first and then infantry tries to attack, and if it fails, well, there's another artillery barrage, and then there's another infantry attack. You can ask yourself the question: to what extent that is really combined arms warfare? Um, now, it's, it's better than, there's another th thing that's in the definition that instead of being used separately, and, and what the Russians not, are not doing is use them separately, but that was what happened a lot in, in, in the 19th century. I just recall a, a battle that took place in Belgium, Waterloo in 1815, where, where basically cavalry was fighting cavalry, infantry was fighting infantry, and artillery was fighting in enemy artillery. So we had three arms on the same battlefield, but not fighting in a synchronized way, not sequentially either, because these battles took place at the same time in the same afternoon of, of June 18th, 1815 in Waterloo, but, but there was no coordination, there was no major plan. And uh, well, finally, in the late afternoon, infantry and, and, and cavalry on, on the French side started working together really working together fighting the same battle that's basically the idea so don't do your separate things where artillery uh preferably shoots at enemy artillery and cavalry preferably doesn't attack infantry but attacks the enemy cavalry so that's separately and then the sequentially well obviously there's always a sequence even in combined arms warfare uh you do things in the right order which does not necessarily imply that artillery will be shooting while infantry advances but it's most of the time it's a good idea to keep your artillery fighting while your infantry is advancing and what you were mentioning is the, the the famous rolling barrages developed during the first world war but also practiced during the, the second world war for instance by uh, by uh, montgomery and al alamein uh, in north africa in, in, in late 42. Um, so where you ask your own artillery to shoot just in front of your own advancing troops. And basically the infantry tries to follow the advance of the artillery. And in the first world war, it was something like a hundred meters per five minutes that the artillery fire was moving. And so the, the, the infantry man had to crawl behind the artillery fire. And indeed one of the guidance that was given was is you needed to feel the the shrapnel a little bit, it needs to be ting ting on your helmet, and then you were close enough. And I always tell the joke to my students that if, if it's really, if you start bleeding, you're too close, <laughs> you should take some distance. And if you, but if you don't feel the, um, I can't come up with the word, the, 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 well, the, the, the sound of the, of the, the shrapnel, the, the, shrapnel huh? the, the, the metal parts, if they don't hit you slightly and they don't think on your helmet, then you're not 
close enough to the artillery barrage. So uh, I don't think a friendly fire is a goal in itself, but it indicates that you are closely cooperating with your own artillery. Um, if, it's, if we're talking about rolling barrage, and that is what your testimony was uh, talking about, I think, uh, in the interwar period. So that is rolling barrage. Um, and, and that's just one, one or two arms working together. Now uh, we have tanks developed during the First World War. And there too, you need a close cooperation. Um, and, and that requires a lot of training because I already saw some video footage from Ukraine where a Russian soldier just walks in front of an enemy, a friendly tank and the friendly tank fires and the guy is, 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 is well, by the blast. He's, he's just, uh, well, I don't know if he's killed. Probably. Perhaps he's even killed by his own tank because he doesn't know that he shouldn't be walking in front of an own tank and and, and friendly tank while it fires. So um, uh, the, the, just for security reasons, you really need to be training uh, together uh, very well. Um, and because we now have a lot of uh, weapon systems, uh, more weapon systems than in the First World War, whether it's drones, helicopters, precision guided munition, uh, uh, man, mines, for instance, uh, which require engineers to have closer than in the First World War. Uh, well, it, it has become a lot more complicated. Electronic warfare, air defense, um, all that needs to be integrated in combined arms warfare formations, force structures uh, as well. So it's uh, very complicated uh, to plan it, to execute it. And, and that is why it's even more important to train on it. And, and as I already uh, mentioned uh, earlier, uh, well, it, it's 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 the last phase of training. You can't yeah. start. You can't train combined arms warfare if you don't. If your infantry unit and your tank units are are not well trained on their own, so very difficult uh, to to achieve. But but once you achieve it, and once everything works well together, you get a fantastic orchestra. So for a few a bit more abstractly so basically one of the absolute key requirements is coordination and coordination in that sense requires good communication which itself is basically the interpersonal communication between the arms and this requires an understanding of the capabilities uh, of, of both sides and also of course the communication capabilities in terms of technology so now for the First World War, this was rather limited because there were very few radios and other stuff. And nowadays they are rather high, of course, then in comes electronic warfare with like, in, uh, where there basically nothing works anymore if, if the enemy is doing proper electronic uh, warfare and basically champs everything. So so a, a lot of this is about, I mean, there's this one example, one from, from, the first, uh, from the Second World War for Stalingrad like a uh, panzer division, they ran out of their infantry, of their, of their organic infantry in the division. And they, they were supported by regular infantry from the infantry division. But for these guys, these were ever infantrymen, for them a tank was invulnerable. And so they never really provided the support to the tank and, and the Germans lost tanks that would have been not lost if the organic infantry was there with, the, with whom they were trained. And this is something, uh, a problem where, where, where and many, there, I think I found several files where, where, infant, where, where the tank arm provided instances where the officers or something wasted their tanks. And the most interesting quote I wrote, uh, read, but I couldn't find it again, was that an infantry officer said, it, it cost Germany half a year or a year to produce a tank but it costs germany 18 years to produce an infantryman so i don't care if we lose a tank or not i was not... i was like okay that's an interesting point that that's that's uh, unfortunately the conservatism I, i'm i'm talking about uh, there's a, there's a lot of anim animosity uh, in the interwar period uh, about the future role of, of, of tanks. 
Um, because combined arms warfare in the First World War was centered around the infantry. It was the infantry who dictated the pace, the rhythm of the operations. And basically, tanks supported infantry, artillery supported infantry, engineers supported infantry, and even aviation supported infantry by close air support, but also by flying over the battlefields, picking up the signals, because there was this... Uh, uh, wireless uh, telegraphy telegraph uh, system in in the airplane so they could communicate with morse code obviously but they could com communicate directly to the headquarters so they were uh, airplanes were were an, an, a crucial part in the in the communication solution of of the first uh, world war but but uh but but it ha it took some time to get there because one of the things uh, that i recall in 1914 was that artillery officers refu refused to open fire on enemy concentration when it was an infantry officer who called it in because they they claimed no an infantry officer he doesn't know how we work we want an artillery man to to claim the target and to confirm the target and then we'll open fire so only in 1915 there came orders saying that some infantry man from the company commander up could ask some artillery pieces to open fire on the enemy when he was attacking or, or trying something so so that is such a distrust um but in the first world war so combined arms warfare around infantry and what you see obviously in, in 1940 may 1940 is that it's the tank that's central to the combined arms warfare and the rest is trying to support the tanks if the tanks are not too fast but these this kind of competition between between infantry artillery tank units it's it's so common um now, since since the first years of the Second World War, I think we have passed to a more balanced, flexible combined arms warfare, where depending on the terrain, depending on the enemy, depending on your own uh, force structure, it can be combined arms warfare where infantry and all the rest are supporting the tank, and it can be the tank supporting the infantry, for instance, in urban warfare. A tank definitely has its place in urban warfare, but it's rather to support infantry uh, then it is infantry supporting tanks, um, generally speaking. So, so I think nowadays we need to train our junior officers and, and our young officers in a very flexible combined arms warfare. Not saying you will be, you will have the lead, or you will have the lead to the tanks or to the infantry men, but to explain them that depending on the situation, they might have a lead or might not have a lead, and they have to be ready either to support or to be supported. But that is something uh, that we, we only do since the final years of the Second World War, where the tank was no longer uh, invulnerable because there were better anti-tank anti weapons uh, that were developed. Well, that, then the tank couldn't move alone because he was too vulnerable against, uh, well, for instance, the bazooka. Um, so, so he needed more, uh, more support from, from infantrymen that kept the bazooka shooters down uh, while, while they were around the tank, protecting the tank, uh, which is still today. Now it's no longer a bazooka, but it's an RPG or a, a similar system. And, and for the longer ATGMs, you need artillery to suppress positions where you think uh, that an ATGM shooter is uh, hiding. Um, so, so you 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 will need uh, combined arms warfare, not necessarily tanks being supported by all the rest or infantry supported by all the rest, but uh, a more flexible system, I think. But again, that to a certain extent hurts the feelings of many uh, officers because they think that they are the best and the best branch and the best arm. And, and and another problem that is uh, it, 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 in the same order is the com competition between aviation and and ground forces, uh, um, where aviation is, uh, well sometimes things they need to do in history where they think they their strategic bombing, for instance, is much more valuable than tactical interventions such as close air support. Um, I believe nowadays close air support is, 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 is accepted, but imagine a war where you lack airplanes, airframes, and uh, well, you can choose either uh, to do uh, deep attacks, uh, strategic bombing, or close air support, very risky. 
perhaps very limited use. Um, so it's and you complicated can complicated for coordination. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can. I can imagine now that uh, aviation tells ground forces we will not support you here because we lack the means. Uh, so these these tensions were very common in the twentieth century. Um, I think nowadays, well, officers are more trained to do uh, combined arms warfare in general. And the philosophy is being taught now. I think uh, more than than in the past. But uh, there are still, uh, apparently it's not easy to put, to do it because uh, the Russians aren't capable of, of uh, applying combined arms warfare in Ukraine right now. Um, and I'm, I'm still very much wor- wondering if Ukraine, Cuba, the, the, the new brigades, brigades that are now being trained by Europe and, and uh, by the uh, United States in particular, are sufficiently or will be sufficiently trained in combined arms warfare in uh, for their spring or, or summer offensive uh, that is uh, well supposedly coming up uh, in the next weeks or, or perhaps months so the question is will these new units will be they, will they be sufficiently trained to do combined arms warfare because i honestly think that will be necessary to break through the russian lines uh, that are not longer that thin as they were in September near Kharkiv, for instance. Um, uh, they have now more depth to the defensive positions. They have uh, second and third line positions. So it will not be as swift as it has been in September uh, 22 uh, near Kharkiv, I think. Uh, so the, the Ukrainians will have to fight better than they did in September. I, didn't, I don't say they, fought, they didn't fight well then but they will have to do better to break through the russian lines in uh, spring 23 than in september 22 and i think the key to that is combined arms warfare but uh, the ukrainian brigades had to be trained from from scratch there's a lot of mobilized personnel in them uh, uh, as i as i read so that means th- these people have started by training how to put on their boots how to put on their uniforms and then eventually took place in a tank and became tank driver and then they were learned to work together with as a small team on the tank and then with other tanks and then hopefully also with infantry and artillery and engineers but that's something that we will have to see uh, but it's clear that to break through the russian lines with all these minefields you will need the cooperation of the engineers first mm-hmm. of all you will need the artillery to uh, suppress the enemy support your attack you will need a combination of tanks and infantry perhaps perhaps for the breakthrough it will be the infantry who will lead the maneuver supported by tanks and then the tanks can hopefully execute the uh, uh, exp- ex- ex- exploitation after the breakthrough where you need more mobile forces um, but that that remains to be seen who who will be taking the lead. But it's clear that you need combined arms warfare. Well, yeah. it's clear to me at least uh, Ukrainians will need a good combined arms warfare, a good orchestra to have that one plus one plus one equals five uh, yeah. combined arms warfare. And and the tanks, if the if the breakthrough for the exploitation, also need need basically air defense as well, ground based air defense, because helicopters yeah. and or. A close air support will yep. then be once the the break out of the air defense how you call shield um, yeah the, the shield air defense yeah, the, la- layer of, of the, the front umbrella line, basically the umbrella yeah, yeah that's yeah yeah they they will hopefully get out of their own umbrella so the umbrella needs to follow and for that you need the mechanized uh, systems um, which which. Well, I don't know if they really have them. On the, on, on the other hand, the, the, the Russian Air Force, uh, fortunately, has not been uh, very active and very successful either. Not, not in Kharkiv either, because Kharkiv is really close to the Russian border, where they could theoretically uh, intervene easier. Whereas now the, the most probable point of attack will be the south, uh, whether direction of Militopol or uh, Mariupol. Uh, these axes are uh, the most uh, probable axes of advance of, of the Ukrainian forces. So will will the Russian uh, air force from Crimea or uh, from across the Sea of Azov uh, be able to intervene? That, that remains to be seen. 
but air defense will have to move along with the tanks, uh, such as the artillery. That's why uh, I believe the uh, Americans uh, donated the M109 uh, self-propelled guns, the British the AS90, and, and the, the Panzer Howitzer 2000, and, and all these systems. Well, they, they are mechanized for a reason, because they have to be able to follow the quick advance. Of what once the, the the exploitation is done, and that that's the question. Well, that's one of the questions I have according uh, regarding the the Ukrainian counteroffensive, spring offensive. Is will the breakthrough be achieved, and, yeah. and w will there be an exploitation? Uh, yeah. yeah, but I mean, the, anyway, the first is a break in, then a breakthrough, and then it's the question: Do you do an exploitation because it's also risky as well? Yeah, 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 and then you have basically two options and that's another term that's often uh uh used for uh, ukraine as well it's it's what the british developed in the third battle of Ypres, Bashendale, uh, in 1917 it's bite and hold where you break through the enemy lines and finally you consolidate what you have taken and then you start all over again so you bite hold bite hold bite hold and eventually you will uh, advance by by step which is less risky more sure slower less spectacular but well there are pluses and minuses so inconveniences and advantages at the same time so it's a choice you have to make but obviously uh, most generals will prefer breakthrough and exploitation because that makes uh, your name will appear in history books which is not always the case with the breakthrough and a consolidation because that's yeah. only a small small victory but perhaps it will be the, the most workable solution for the Ukrainian armed forces right now to to do this approach of fight and hold uh, instead of by breakthrough and exploitation. But in any case, in any case, any scenario, I think you will need the combined arms warfare to, just to break through these uh, yeah. Russian Russian fortified lines. If, if you don't do combined arms warfare, you will see what we have witnessed all, and we have the video footage. And the the the, the, vid, the photos uh, of the Russian failed offensive at Fuledar in the south of Ukraine, where they lost uh, up to 130 armored vehicles, uh, visually confirmed 130 in, in, in one one single attack near Fuledar in in the south of Ukraine. So why is that? Because they don't apply combined arms warfare, and they just run into a minefield where they are uh, moreover attacked by enemy artillery, which means you don't attack the enemy artillery, which is one of the first things you should do uh, when you attack, uh, plan to attack yourself, is, is to counter battery, uh, put counter battery fire on the enemy's uh, artillery system. So uh, a lot of uh, failures, I think. It's a very interesting case study. Um, and another example of, 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 of uh, bad combined arms warfare is the failed river crossing of the Severia Donetsk River. In, I think it was in Belohorivka in, uh, in May 2022 uh, by the Russians as well, where they lost uh, more than 100 vehicles in a failed river crossing as well. A river crossing is, is one of the, 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 the standard uh, operations where you need combined arms warfare in a very synchronized way in a very synchronized way. Because I, I think uh, for a good combined arms warfare, the principle of mission command is very important, but not in all cases. A river crossing, for instance, is an exception to the, the rule that mission command is a good idea because there you need to really have some kind of a scenario, minute by minute, second by second, who will be doing what. And you don't so have it's really to... rigid in that case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, I think uh, combined arms warfare suits perfectly well with a mission command. A mission command is um, where you give your subordinates a, a mission, but you don't detail how they have to execute it. Um, and a second part of, of mission command is that every subordinate really understands the maneuver and the scenario in, and the operation in which he's taking part, which means he doesn't only understand his own personal role, but also if he's a platoon commander, the, the role and the mission of the company, but also the battalion, and why not even the brigade? So you need to know the commander's intent, for instance, what is the what does the commander wants to achieve? So you will tell your, your unit, your squad or your platoon to uh, uh, make sure that they conquer a certain crossroad at 1500, but you will not tell them how to do it. And, and the how-to is, is being filled in by uh, the junior officer commanding the platoon that gets the mission 
uh, to be done, which makes him more responsible, which makes him more, uh, I allows him more to think and, and to be more flexible and, and instead of uh, just executing blindly the orders that are, are given. So it's, it's a flexible system of command. It doesn't mean everybody can do what he wants, obviously not, but it's not so rigid where you get an order to attack at this hour using this uh, road uh, or itinerary, and you cannot uh, step uh, one meter from it. Uh, um, it's a more flexible system, uh, a lot of freedom to ex for the execution, uh, for execution, and, and it makes sure that your subordinates think about what they are doing. And it will allow you to explore the opportunities whenever they uh, are presenting them to you. I think that's uh, that's the the main thing about mission mission command. Now, there are entire books that are written on it, uh, but <laughs> that that's perhaps for uh, another video. Uh, the liberty of, of 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 how you execute your order, understanding the scenario in the operation in which you take part, not only your part, but also uh, two levels up and even higher. So you can understand what's important and uh, behave accordingly. And if there's an opportunity and you understand the importance of the opportunity, you go for it uh, instead of just st stick, sticking to your own mission, which is to advance to a certain line. But if there's no enemy ahead, well, perhaps you should ask if you could, could go, go further because there's no enemy ahead. Um, so that is the mission command, a lot of uh, flexibility given to local commanders, which is apparently now becoming a little bit an issue in the Ukrainian armed forces, because many of the junior officers that were trained accordingly mission, with mission command by the uh, well, Americans, uh, they have disappeared in the first year of the war. And apparently now uh, more old school Soviet officers are or now so in disappeared charge. in the sense of losses, I assume. Yeah, 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 yeah. Killed or wounded in action. Uh, so they're not in their uh, units anymore. So we know, uh, we now have uh, certain Ukrainian units uh, that fight in a very Soviet style, which is not uh, the, the modern Western way of fighting with uh, the uh, equipment that they now receive. They should apply the modern Western uh, combined arms warfare, maneuver warfare. Uh, so, uh, well, mission command is 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 one uh, a crucial part of the. Uh, I, I think for for uh, combined arms warfare, N not in all cases. There are certain scenarios, such as the river crossing, where you need to have a very clear schedule uh, followed closely by everybody. No, no room for impro improvisation. Uh, but but uh, if not, uh, combined arms warfare combined with mission command, I think it's uh, it's a perfectly workable duo. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.